Welcome to the Nine Elements Podcast, brought to you by Restore Hyper Wellness. I'm your host, Eric Hinman. Each week, I sit down with trailblazers in the fitness, nutrition, and wellness communities, exploring how they optimize their daily lives for ultimate performance to do more of what they love. I'm a five-time Ironman brand builder and someone who is obsessed with health and wellness, structuring much of my day around fitness and recovery protocols. My guest today is good friend, Kate Kroll. After struggling with anxiety, panic attacks, and digestive issues, Kate visited a nutritional therapy practitioner and learned for the first time how the food we eat and how our digestive system's ability to absorb that food sets the tone for our entire health landscape. Working in Bangladesh with women and children in a nutritional rehab unit and acute health settings sealed the deal for Kroll, who earned her master's in blood chemistry in 2020. Let's backtrack. I met you five years ago, right? Yeah, crazy. Five years ago. Just Went by fast. Was it at Just Be Kitchen or did I meet Stu? I, I met your husband, Stu, at Just Be Kitchen. And then maybe we met at Just Be Kitchen too after meeting I think we did. Stu, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I think we did. Because you met with him and then I had known about you. And I think we ran into each other at Just Be Kitchen. And I was like, you're Eric, right? We're getting lunch tomorrow, right? And I think uh, like we were both at JBK the day before we were actually going to get lunch together. So we passed each other, came back, had lunch again. <laughs> the, those were like the days Stu and I were living in downtown Denver and would ride our bikes down the Cherry Creek Trail and pretty much lived at Just Be Kitchen and ate there all the time. And you did too, but you were coming down from the Highlands. Yeah, so. I would walk there every morning, yeah. about a mile, you know, rain, snow, whatever. Um, one of the nine elements of hyper wellness is nourishment. So that's why we both went to Just Be Kitchen is because Jen, the owner, yep. is all about nourishing food. Um, and then you moved right near me. We, we were neighbors for about a a year yeah. and a half in Rhino and I called Kate my Denver mom because during that period <laughs> of time I was eating out pretty much every single meal but once a week I would walk two blocks down to their house and I would get a home-cooked meal from Kate who is an amazing amazing chef <laughs> yeah thank you yeah those were good days that was a blast and we were I mean Stu and I were just learning entrepreneurship and business and you always had so much wisdom to share and we would always just chat, catch up, have a good meal. And uh, yeah, I feel like that's really when our friendship, me, you and Stu collectively just started growing, got to know each other super well. And yeah, it was a great time. Awesome times. Sure was. So Kate was a collegiate athlete, pole vault, right? Yep. Was a pole vaulter. What, what was the highest jump you ever completed? Um, in meets, 12 feet in practice, because um, practice there's less pressure. I always jumped higher in practice, uh, 13, a little around 13 feet. In practice was practice wow. PR. So that's yeah, crazy. It's it good times. Yeah. It's kind of wild to think about. I literally haven't touched a pole since college. So we'll have to find a high school track and uh, hit the pole vault one of these days. I'll have to teach you guys some things and see if I still got it. Yeah, it's so interesting how we gravitate towards other sports later in life. I mean, I played basketball, baseball, um, I ran track, cross country, played one year of football in high school, and, you know, now CrossFit and triathlon, and, you know, I feel like we start doing more individual type sports, but still with that camaraderie of team, just because it's tougher to get groups of people together to do, you know, more team-based sports, or, you know, with pole vault, it, it, it's also, you know, you're, you're on a team, you're doing it in track practice, you're with other people and just harder to organize that stuff as everyone's priorities, yeah. you know, change. For sure. Yeah. I don't know how you would keep up pole vaulting after, <laughs> after, I mean, all the equipment and everything's so expensive, but you know, I think that's why, you know, you and I have organically kind of been interested in CrossFit. There's a lot of other athletes that we're friends with that, you know, were athletes got into CrossFit. I think we all kind of missed that a, you know, individual, but team aspect of just, you know, getting your butt whooped in a hard workout and sweating with other people and kind of suffering with other people and growing and getting stronger that I think the, you know, the CrossFit workouts that we all get to do together are just so rewarding. And it's kind of in our blood as athletes that we get to do that together as adults, even though we're not necessarily, you know, training for a sport per se, some of us are, but you know, yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think most of our friend group, they're, they're using movement and exercise as a way to fuel, you know, mental clarity, emotional well-being, creativity, flow state, instead of, 
you know, I think what a lot of people see an aesthetic, you know, the aesthetic I always say is a byproduct of, I just want to feel like the best version of myself every day. And, you know, I'm very, um, accomplishment oriented. Like I want to keep moving the ball forward. And I I know you do too. And, you know, by exercise is one of those tiny wins for me every single day where I just feel like I'm moving the, the ball forward a little bit, you know, it makes me feel good day in and day out. It brings me that energy to then, you know, show up as the best version of myself for others. And I know you're the same with exercise, nourishment, and all of the different things you do. Yeah, all about optimizing. Yeah. So college, what was your major? I majored in global public health and nutrition. Okay. And then at yeah. what at what point did you go on to, and, and walk me through the process of becoming an NTP or nutrition therapy practitioner? Yeah, geez. I mean, it's a long story, but in a nutshell, the short version is that, you know, I went into college undecided. I didn't know what I wanted to study. I knew that I was passionate about helping other people, but I didn't really know exactly in what domain or how or what I wanted to do exactly to help people. I just knew that I loved people, super extroverted and wanted to do something that would help. And so I took some electives um, that my academic advisor suggested, because when you're an athlete, as was D1 athlete, and you know we mentioned this with pole vaulting, but you get kind of first pick of classes. And so we would sit down every semester and I hit sophomore year and she was like, you got to declare a major like next semester, you got to figure out what you want to do. And I was like, shit, like, what am I going to do? I don't even know what I want. Um, and so she suggested based on the things that I had mentioned, I was interested in helping people that I try some public health courses. And so I took some gen eds that were genuine public health, which is health of populations in any given country, and then global public health, which is the focus of um, population health in developing countries. So it's very different focus of how you would address those different populations based on developing world or developed world. So I fell in love with global public health focused on, um, you know, simple global life saving solutions, and then also fell in love with the nutrition aspect. And um, went to Bangladesh when I was 20 after sophomore year of college because I had a lot of professors that were MPH or masters of public health and people who get their MPH are usually doing field work and they're traveling, working in the field. And I was like, man, if I'm loving this so much, you know, it's really easy for me to sit in my college classroom and say that like I love public health and I love all these things, but I've never actually been there. I've never actually done it. So what does it look like and what does it feel like for me to actually go to these developing countries, get my hands dirty, so to speak, and get into the field. And is this really what I want? So I went to Bangladesh by myself. Um, I kind of like created my own summer research internship that wasn't through my college. I just wanted to go, which is just, you know, part of my personality. I'm very independent and will just, you know, if I feel something deeply that I'm called to, I will just go do it even if it doesn't make sense. Um, And so Bangladesh was kind of like that for me personally. And while I was there, I worked in the nutrition rehabilitation unit with women and children. And so I saw a lot of kids who were dealing with these acute, you know, nutritional issues. And a lot of people in Bangladesh and other developing countries die of dehydration from diarrheal disease. So they literally die of dehydration from diarrhea, from communicable diseases like cholera and things like that. And one of the first steps of that disease process and like mechanism of action is that it really just destroys the intestinal lining, the mucosal barrier of the intestinal lining. We've got 70% of our immune system in our gut associated lymphoid tissue that's in the gut. And so a lot of what I was doing was helping people just learn how to feed themselves and nourish themselves based on like a cent a day or whatever it was that they were getting in the slums of Bangladesh. And there was a lot of people doing research on vitamin A deficiency and night blindness and zinc deficiency and gut issues. <laughs> so going to Bangladesh kind of exposed me to this whole other end of the spectrum of nutrition and health for populations and individuals. Whereas in the United States and issues that I had personally been dealing with were really focused on chronic issues, chronic digestive issues, chronic health issues, you know, all across the board. So when I was in Bangladesh, I was like, oh my gosh, nutrition has this incredible ability not just to address and support and heal um, and hopefully prevent chronic issues like we see in the United States. But you know, in Bangladesh, I was like, holy crap, it has this ability to support people that are dealing with these acute issues as well. And so one day we had this kid that had extreme hypoglycemia, so extreme low blood sugar. And he came in, I'll never forget, I was in the ICU this day, just doing rounds with some of the doctors. And this kid came in on this like metal bed, pretty much. I mean, because it's you know developing country, simple global life saving solutions is the focus. And so this kid came in having a full on seizure, just convulsing like crazy, 
past this like crazy bowel movement, which I guess is common when people are seizing up. And I was like, oh my gosh, like what am I watching? Had no idea what was going on, but he had such extreme blood sugar that he had gone into hypoglycemic shock and was having a seizure. And all the doctors were like, oh, you know, it's fine. We'll hook him up to some glucose on an IV and he'll be fine in 20 minutes. And he was. And so I think all of those experiences, and I'm, you know, there's a lot more crazy stories from that trip, but a lot of those experiences just really drove home my excitement and interest in nutrition because it was like, wow, if it can support the body in these acute settings, but it can also support the body in these chronic settings, you know, there's really something here. And so when I came back from that trip, I just full sent into looking at a bunch of different nutrition programs and a lot of what you hear in the nutrition field, if you want like this linear path to practicing and being in the field is going the RD route, the registered dietitian route. Mm -hmm. And this is somewhat controversial, but I'll just be completely honest because that's <laughs> that's who I am. That's my personality. But the RD program is, you know, a governmental type of program um, as an educational platform is sponsored by Monsanto, USDA, FDA, Pepsi, you know, all these big, large corporations. And I had a lot of professors in college who were RDs that were brilliant, but it was very clinical. It was very focused on hospital settings, you know, working with people who had just had a heart attack and you've got to teach them how to do X, Y, Z so it doesn't happen again, but you're working largely with populations who don't really want to help themselves. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it too, you know, just the ethos of the nutrition education through that program was a lot of things that I didn't necessarily agree with. And I wanted to fully understand how does the body function optimally? How does it commonly dysfunction? What can we do about it? And I came into nutrition with the belief that the body is designed to heal itself. And a lot of the RD program, I wasn't seeing those themes in there. And so I kind of went down this rabbit hole of trying to find other nutritional programs that kind of had the same mentality and same framework and foundational approach that I felt was true and had helped me as well. And that's like a whole other thing. It's just my story personally with health and nutrition and things like that. But um, we can get to that in a little bit. But what I ended up doing was I reached out to a bunch of other people that had gone through various nutrition programs, naturopathic doctors, chiropractors, um, nutritional therapy practitioners. Um, there's so many different programs. And so I literally just called people, found people on Instagram, found people online, searched people in my area, asked them out to coffee, sat down and said, hey, what do you think about your program? Did you like it? If you could do it again, would you do it again? And just had a lot of these conversations and I just kept coming back to the nutritional therapy program. And so that was the one that I decided when I finished my undergrad in global public health and nutrition, that I was just going to full send into the NTP program. So that was the first certification that I completed. And then I went on to complete um, some levels in restorative wellness solutions, which has allowed me to run functional labs with our clients. And I'm not a doctor. I do not diagnose or treat disease. And the ability to run these labs is, you know, not to diagnose or treat disease. It's really just the ability to look at these labs and see what, what kind of imbalances are going on in the body, um, you know, ways that the body may need to be supported, deficiencies that we might be seeing. So I went on to do restorative wellness solutions. And then I forget if this was last year or the year before I completed a master blood chemistry course to look at blood work from a functional perspective. So I've just kind of, you know, NTP was the first thing and then I've just slowly added on as we've worked with more clients and I've seen a need for more comprehensive work with those people. So, yeah. I love it. I mean, it seems like it's somewhat new knowledge that we can heal ourselves from the inside out. You know, I don't remember learning any of this as I was growing up. It's not really until the last 10 years that I've been able to understand that. And, you know, people on podcasts are talking about it. And, you know, we have all of these preventative me measures. So, yeah, I think that's the important point of this this topic is you can heal yourself from the inside out and gut health is linked to so many, so many things, you know, emotional well-being, serotonin levels. Um, you know, again, it's not like diet isn't just an aesthetic. It's how you feel day in and day out, how you're operating. Um, talk a little bit more about the, this mucosal barrier, because I was having a conversation yesterday with, uh, Dr. Sarah at Armra Colostrum, mm -hmm. who I know you, you also work with and you use their product. And, you know, she was talking a bit about, you know, in the U S so, you know, first world country, um, 
you know, certainly not as acute as what you were talking about in Bangladesh. Yeah. And that's really cool. You got to see like some extreme examples, but you know, here it's not as extreme, but we do have all of these different things, pollutants and the clothes we're wearing and stuff that are, that are breaking down our mucosal barrier. And you know, that's, that's why there's these chronic diseases in the U S when, you know, we're living in this first world country where, you know, we have access to, you know, lots of things to be healthy. So yeah, talk a little bit about about the that mucosal barrier <laughs> yeah so i mean i <laughs> there i have like some funny analogies because i think when we start talking about these more complex things it's easy to get lost in the weeds on these really nerdy you know science-based types of descriptions and so i always like to take these complex things and break them down into a really easy way to understand so one of the best ways that i could give an analogy about understanding the mucosal barrier of the gut is the mucosal barrier of the gut, and this is a hilarious analogy, so feel free to laugh at me. Um, but the mucosal barrier of the gut is almost like the snot of the digestive tract. So we're super familiar with the mucosal of our respiratory system. Mm -hmm. When we get sick, we get you know a buildup of mucus, we blow our nose, maybe the eyes are watering, maybe we've got that post-nasal drip. So that mucosal barrier, essentially what that is, is we have a lining of cilia, which are these hair-like projections um, that are covered in mucus. Mucus is largely made up of protein and water and it sits over that cilia. And what it does, and this is part of our innate immune system, we're born with it, um, that mucosal lining will trap different types of pollutants, bacteria, pathogens, toxins, whatever. Mm -hmm. And what it's doing is those hair-like projections are constantly in the respiratory system, pushing things up and out. So when we're sick, we're blowing our nose and everything's coming up and out. You don't ever want to swallow that stuff back in. Your body's trying to expel it and get rid of it. And so in the same type of way, we have this type of mucosal barrier that's part of the immune system that's in the gut, but it's pushing things out in the opposite direction. So, you know, if anyone's dealing with mucus in their digestive tract, this is a really common sign of some sort of inflammation, irritation, maybe some sort of infection. Again, I'm not a doctor. I don't diagnose or treat disease, but these are just some of the innate signs that the body is dealing with something but internally this mucosal lining and this mucosal barrier is a huge part again like i just mentioned of our immune system because it's trapping pathogens and expelling them and when it comes to the digestive tract i mean there's just a plethora of you know kind of like what you got into a plethora of connections from the gut to the entire body if you think about it Every single cell in our body is relying upon our digestive system's ability to properly break down and assimilate nutrients and differentiate between, you know, cells and amino acids and fatty acids and, you know, nutrients that are needed in the body and ones that are waste and should not be in the body. And we have a single cell layer in our small intestine where we absorb all of our nutrients that has to differentiate between these two things. So the entire digestive process, the differentiation between, you know, nutrients, not nutrients, pathogens, toxins. This is just a huge part of the body's innate intelligence and in determining what to do with these different substances coming through the digestive tract. So if we have compromised digestion, irritation, inflammation, food sensitivities, and we're still continuing to eat and inflame, you know, those tight junction cells in the small intestine, we're really opening the door to a bunch of other different types of immune issues. Um, autoimmunity, leaky gut is kind of like the classic thing that people are probably super familiar with. Mm -hmm. with but probably don't really know what that actually means um but Ex essentially what that is it's just a yeah so and this gets kind of nerdy so i'll try to keep it simple but the tight junction cells in the small intestine like i mentioned it's a single cell layer and they are absorbing pretty much all of our nutrients and so the way that i like to describe it is like putting your hands together tightly and this is kind of how I'm blocking my mouth, but this is kind of how our tight junction cells hold each other. They hold each other very tightly together. And so if we have any sort of irritation, inflammation, food sensitivities, gluten, zonulin, any type of protein or anything that maybe we're sensitive to that's irritating or inflaming that tight junction cell, mm -hmm. we can have what's called leaky gut where those tight junction cells, instead of holding each other tightly, will actually loosen up and we start to get these gaps. And instead of individual amino acids and individual fatty acids or individual molecules of glucose assimilating through that cell layer into the bloodstream, we end up having chains of amino acids or chains of fatty acids. And we have food and molecules and particles getting into the bloodstream in a way that the body doesn't recognize. Mm -hmm. So what opens the door at that point is that we can have systemic issues. So this is where we see things where like if we have leaky gut, sometimes people can have skin issues, autoimmune issues, mental health challenges, 
inflammation, joint pain, um, because as soon as something hits the bloodstream, it can go systemic. So Mm -hmm. gut issues and gut immune function is not necessarily just secluded to digestive health. And that's probably one of the biggest myths that I feel like I bust with a lot of clients Mm -hmm. is we'll have people that come to us. They're like, oh, you know, my gut's fine, but like my skin's really dry or like my joints really hurt and I've got all these issues. And I'm like, we got to go to the gut. We got to see if you've got leaky gut. We need to have gut healing Mm -hmm. nutrients. We need to support the immune system. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like I mentioned before, we've got 70% of our immune system in our gut. So if you want to support immune health, you've got to support gut health. It's just a huge piece of the puzzle. So, Mm -hmm. so your coach, uh, walk us through how you test for this stuff. Kind of your, I know Sarah's going through it right now. My girlfriends walk us through the Mm -hmm. process of understanding if you have gut issues issues and then you know how how do you how do you test how do you heal it yeah so I mean one of the biggest things with gut health again is just looking at you know first and foremost looking at your signs and symptoms so we do a lot of intake forms very comprehensive intake forms when we're looking at working with a new client so we want to know like how's your sleep how's your energy how are your bowel movements that's kind of like a taboo topic that people feel a little awkward chatting about with us on my team Mm -hmm. but We've got to ask you about your bowel movements. Are your bowel mm-hmm. movements floating? Are they clay colored? Do you have undigested food in your bowel movements? Are you bloated after eating? Mm-hmm. Are you bloated an hour after eating or is it two to three hours after eating? Because that time difference is going to kind of point us towards which part of the digestive process we're noticing dysfunction. So if it's within an hour after eating, it's usually an upper GI issue, which we commonly see as people not being in a parasympathetic or rest and digest state because we need to be in that nervous system state for the brain to properly signal to all of our digestive organs to create these gastric juices so we can optimally break down our food. So we see that as part of upper GI bloating, not enough stomach acid, not chewing your food enough or drinking too many liquids with meals because if we're drinking too much water with food, it can dilute that stomach acid Mm -hmm. and prolong that period of your hydrochloric acid or your stomach acid breaking down your foods. So a lot of that would be upper GI, lower GI stuff would be, um, you know, bloating two to three hours after eating, you know, stomach aches, cramping, pain, um, you know, anything that we'd be seeing in the, you know, large and small intestine absorption issues, if we're seeing undigested food and bowel movement. So we kind of, you know, really getting into the weeds here, but we look at a lot of signs and symptoms first and foremost, and kind of troubleshoot from there. If we're working with someone who has pretty complex issues, this is where I like to bring in further testing. And so we do run stool tests, food sensitivity tests, as well as toxicity testing. And Eric, you kind of touched on this earlier in the podcast, but I mean, you know, we're not living in a developing country in the United States and, you know, in other developed countries, but we are dealing with a lot of toxicity, pathogens, chemicals in our food. We have a very toxic modern environment. It's just part of living in the world. So we actually run urine tests because we kick out a lot of these environmental toxins through our urine and through the kidneys they're processed there and so we look at um man all sorts of things mycotoxins heavy metals environmental toxins like volatile organic compounds so those vocs that's anything that's going from a liquid to a gas so like when you're gassing up your car that's an example of a voc or you buy new furniture and it's off gassing that's a voc Um, we also look at plastics pesticides, herbicides, all sorts of different things. So we have a pretty comprehensive intake. It's bio-individual and it just depends on what each client is presenting with. So we do work with people in a one-on-one setting, but to kind of recap, we'll do that, you know, the in-depth symptom analysis, look at everything, we'll run labs if we need to and see what's going on. And then in terms of healing, um, there is somewhat of an order of operations that we follow. So first and foremost, we always support what I refer to as the drainage or detoxification pathways. Mm-hmm. So we have all these God-given, incredible you know, detoxification pathways and organs like our liver, gallbladder, lymphatic system, digestive system. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're supporting those pathways first, because if we're going to be mobilizing or detoxing anything out of the digestive system or anywhere else in the body, we have to make sure that those toxins and pathogens have a place to go. So there's a lot of people Mm -hmm. that would jump into, you know, detox, mold, parasite cleansing, um, addressing dysbiotic bacteria in the gut, et cetera, without first hitting what I again call drainage or detoxification pathway support. And what ends up happening oftentimes with those people is they experience a lot of die-off symptoms, detoxification or Herxheimer symptoms. And they just don't feel great because they're mobilizing more toxins than the body can actively clear. So it's kind of this balance of mobilizing things and clearing things out of the body and rebalancing the ecosystem of the gut 
or you know whatever it is that we're rebalancing alongside how fast the body is actually clearing those toxins. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of the route that we take is drainage detoxification. And then we always go to gut health, parasite cleansing, gut immune function. And then we can move into more complex things if clients are dealing with something like mold, Lyme, co-infections, you know, things like that. So we do work with a lot of very complex clients, but, you know, pretty much with everyone that we work with, simple, complex, wherever they fall, you know, on the scale of issues that they're dealing with, we always hit drainage detoxification and digestive immune function because that's going to precede a lot of other complex issues. And we see a lot of people where, you know, we support drainage detoxification pathways and organs and hit gut health. And, you know, I would say probably 80 to 90 percent of things really clear up because a lot of these other things that we're dealing with is more of an immune dysfunction challenge than it is you know, the actual issue itself. Um, so lots of moving parts. <laughs> so, so step one is kind of asking the client about, you know, what they're going through, what various symptoms they have. And then, so the, the detoxification component of it, that's various supplements that you're subscribing where it's going to bind to toxins in, in their body. Correct. Yeah. So there's, you know, and again, it just depends on the client. Not everybody walks through a full detoxification protocol. Some people do. Some people literally just have some simple gut issues and we'll just go through what I refer to as a scrub the gut protocol. We'll, we'll take, you know, herbs and binders, like what you're referring to, things to bind to systemic toxins and help pull them out of the system. Um, a lot of this has to do with ionic bonds in the body. And, you know, a lot of pathogens and toxins have a negative charge. And if we can get a binder in there that has a positive charge that can attract these things, we can pull them out of the body hmm. and clear them easier through the GI tract and through our various detoxification organs. Um, but yeah, it just depends on the client. And, um, you know, it's always kind of a toss up. But the general rule of thumb is we, we bring in clients, we go through what I refer to as our intro call. We have, you know, give them the opportunity to ask us questions, tell us a little bit more about what they're dealing with. And then we move into actually working with clients. We work in a three month increment with people because honestly, like if you can't commit three months to your health, there's really not much that we can do to help you because mm -hmm. I mean, as you know, with fitness and anything else that you do and supporting your body naturally, it takes time. It takes time to build mm -hmm. up, you know, your gut immunity and to clear things and to get stronger, whatever it is that you're doing. Good mm -hmm. things take time. Um, so there's no magic pill. And so we work in a three month increment. And then we do these, these intake forms. We'll do labs if we need to. We have an hour and a half long initial consultation. We get an individualized protocol put together that has nutrition, supplement, and lifestyle recommendations. Mm -hmm. So in terms of supporting detox pathways that you were kind of jumping into, supplements are a big piece of that for sure because we want to give the body some extra support. But there's also a lot of lifestyle factors that we include as well. And this is kind of where Restore honestly comes into the picture is saunas and you know cryotherapy and all of these different modalities and the hbot these really get just an incredible amount of support into the body when we're dealing with these different types of challenges and issues mm -hmm. um, mold specifically is cleared really well through sweat so mm -hmm. we suggest to most of our clients like you've got to find a sauna infrared would be ideal if you're dealing with this type of toxicity but even if it's just a dry sauna go get moving get sweating um, you know, a great way to support the lymphatic system during a detoxification regimen is just movement, just moving, mm -hmm. just running, walking, exercising, getting upside down, getting inverted, dry brushing. So we do have a lot of these other lifestyle factors that we suggest too, you know, and changing your diet. I mean, some of the most foundational things is where people have the most benefit of like, just drink enough water, get minerals into your water, get electrolytes you know, nourish your cells, get outside in the sun and charge your mitochondria, make sure you're eating enough food, make sure you're eating high quality food. So there's a lot of mm -hmm. different elements that kind of play into this, but yeah. Increasing your metabolism and eating for results driven gains is one small part of optimizing nutrition. If you're listening to Kate's story, she explains how nutrition can relate to every system in the body since our nourishment is feeding our cells. Restore Hyper Wellness takes a more holistic approach to nourishment that puts less focus on plans and more on ensuring you get the right amount of nutrients and hydration. If you're feeling a bit dehydrated, Restore's IV drip therapy is a fantastic way to help the body maximize physical performance, boost the body's natural defense systems, and replenish vital nutrients. If you're in need of nutrients but don't have the time for an IV drip, Restore also offers IM shots to help give you a boost. 
For a more in-depth look into what your body is doing at the molecular level, Restore offers a variety of biomarker assessments to help optimize your nourishment. Knowing this data can help measure your progress and create customized plans to optimize your health through a range of modalities in the most efficient way possible to help you do more day in and day out. Right now, Nine Elements listeners can receive 20% off your first Restore service using the code ELEMENTS20 when making your first appointment. That code again is ELEMENTS20 to save 20% when booking your first service with Restore. Yeah, setting up healthy routines. You know, I think a lot of people sure. see, you know, athletes or people that they consider to be at a high level of wellness and, you know, it's it's intimidating to, you know, the, the a person just getting into some of these practices. Sure. But, you know, I, I think the key is, you know, uh, for me, it's been 12 years of habit stacking, you know, to, you know, one year I focused on sleep, one year I focused on, you know, exercise and purposeful training. One year I focused on sauna and cold exposure. One year I focused on nutrition. So, you know, that it, it's a long journey. It's not like what you said, a, a magic yeah. pill, like, you know, focus one year on resetting your gut, getting that back to where it's supposed to be. Focus one year on hiring a personal trainer to understand, you know, anaerobic conditioning, strength training, aerobic conditioning, all of these different energy systems that, you know, your, your body, your body has, and then, you know, focus one year on sleep, understanding all of the different things you can do to get your seven to eight hours of sleep. And some of that is sunlight, you know, getting up early in the morning. I know that you, you preach and I do too. How, how many minutes of unfiltered sunlight? 30? At least 20. 20? At least 20 yep. minutes of unfiltered sunlight. So getting outside, getting the sun in through your eyes early in the morning, I think is the best time to do it to, yeah. you know, to reset your circadian rhythm. So yep. it's getting sunlight, grounding, walking around, hugging a tree, you know, all yeah. of these little <laughs> things, you know, and again, it seems overwhelming, but you know, once you commit to that for, let's say 60 days to form that new habit, it's on autopilot. And then you move on to the next one and you move on to the next one. And you know, all of a sudden fast forward 10 years and it's like, you've done all of these things to be the best version of yourself, which is, yeah, it's, it's a really cool place to be. Um, let's, uh, let's backtrack to mold. So you had an unfortunate scenario where you discovered some black mold in a home that you guys were living in and, um, walk us through some of the symptoms you had, um, to know that you had mold contamination and you had inflammation from mold in your system. And then, yeah, wa walk us through how you've been able to, you know, get that, that out of your system. Yeah, mold was a really crazy thing. Um, so Sue and I moved into this home. It was a 2,000 square foot ranch and it had a huge crawl space underneath. And the crawl space access was in the master bedroom closet. So right off of our bedroom. And um, this house was a flip. It had like nice lipstick, you know, if you will, in the real estate world. It was just really well done up. And so a lot of these other major issues structurally and you know, foundationally speaking, we just, we didn't see them. We did inspections. Everything was great. You know, we had no idea the types of issues that, you know, really need to look for. And my husband's in real estate. And so it was like clean as a whistle. Everything came back great. Um, you know, the foundation was fine in the house, but we had an issue where the drainage system around the home was not set up properly. And we didn't know that our inspector didn't look for it. It's not something that you're thinking about if you're just a normal person buying a home. So we ended up finding out that there was, um, you know, the, the vapor barrier, which is that plastic covering that goes, should be, you know, in your crawl space, kind of covering the soil and it should be sealed the whole way around and kind of blocking the soil from the rest of the home. Um, ours was not sealed properly. And then we had this drainage issue. And so the way that mold is created is you have mold spores and you have water and you put them together and then you've got an abundance of mold. So we had a crazy amount of mold in that house and we, didn't know it until I started having really weird health issues. So probably first and foremost was my nervous system just was haywire. Um, and Eric remembers this. I was a wreck for years. Like I felt like myself for a while when we first met Eric, then I felt completely effing crazy and out of my mind and just wound up and panicked all the time and paranoid all the time. And I just really couldn't handle stress. I couldn't handle any kind of stressor, any type of unknown situation, even movies that I hadn't seen before were like the ending and plot is unknown. I was like, I can't handle it. Like it just really got to a crazy level. And, you know, I have a history of anxiety and panic attacks growing up that has flared on and off. And I, you know, with mold, it was just another level that I was like, whoa, like I'm not, 
there is nothing going on in my life that I should be this wound up about. Like something is triggering this. And I just had this gut feeling that there was something else going on. And internally and knowing everything that I know in my field, I was like, I feel like I'm not processing things properly. Like my neurotransmitters feel overexcited. Like I'm overhyped up. My nervous system feels super dysregulated. And so, um, you know, kind of what precipitated finally figuring out that it was mold was my husband and I accidentally got pregnant um, while all of this stuff was going on, you know, the anxiety, the panic attacks. Um, I was shaking. This was a really weird symptom that I had is like at night I would lay in bed and like I would just tremor and tremble. And it was almost like I was cold and my body wouldn't regulate properly. I used to have to get in a lot of hot showers or have an electric blanket to even fall asleep because I'd get so cold that I couldn't fall asleep. Um, but like was warm to the touch. It was the weirdest thing. Um, what else was going on? I had, I started getting a bunch of cherry angiomas, which is like those moles, but they're red. And it's almost like a, I don't know if you've seen those before, but I was getting a ton of cherry angiomas that I'd never had before. I was waking up in the middle of the night coughing a lot, waking up in the middle of the night and having to pee a lot. I was having these weird moments throughout the day where I felt like my blood sugar was tanking, but I was you know, bought a blood sugar monitor. My blood sugar was fine. It was clearing sugars, processing pancreas was functioning really well. So I was like, what the hell is going on? Mm -hmm. Ran a ton of blood work. I had all these weird things going on in my blood work, signs of dehydration, even though I was drinking a lot and getting my minerals in. Um, Hemoglobin was low, red blood cell count was high, or hemoglobin was high, red blood cell count was high. My CO2 levels were super suppressed. So if we have CO2 levels that are suppressed, it usually means that the oxygenation of our cells are low as well. Mm -hmm. Um, my cholesterol was also tanked. My bile was super low. So I was not only dealing with all these weird symptoms, but my blood work was super weird. And I had gone to maybe four or five different functional medicine doctors, reached out to a ton of colleagues and was like, what the F is going on? Like, this is crazy. I have no idea what's going on. Um, you know, and I think the most stressful symptom that I was dealing with, honestly, was a lot of the psych symptoms. Um, just like the anxiety, the paranoia, the looping thoughts, panic attacks. Mm -hmm. Um, I also kind of had like this inability to work out. I started getting asthma. My lactic acid threshold was super, super low, meaning like I would start working out and then my muscles would get pumped and cramped and I like couldn't squat or I couldn't run or even going on walks, I would be out of breath. Long story short, um, my husband and I unexpectedly got pregnant while all this was happening. And um, then we unexpectedly had a miscarriage right before the first ultrasound. And that just kind of rocked my world because I was like, whoa, like we've been really healthy for a long time. Something's really wrong here. Something's really going on. And that was kind of my wake up call. And when I had been poking around and asking a lot of my colleagues, like, what is, you know, what does this sound like? I had a handful of them that were like, Kate, this sounds like mold toxicity or mycotoxicosis or mycotoxin illness. And I was like, whatever, you know, like I don't have time to learn about all that other crap. And so before we got pregnant and miscarried, I just inadvertently bought a mycotoxin urine test because I was like, if I have the energy and I can handle the stress of like dealing with all this at some point, maybe I'll run this test and see what's going on. So after we miscarried, I was like, screw it. What do I have to lose? You know, maybe, maybe it is mold, you know, and could mold really do this? And would mold really be the culprit of all this stuff? So took the mycotoxin urine test and the levels were through the roof. So when it comes to mold, there's about five to seven very toxic molds. Not all molds are toxic, meaning not all mold produces toxic mycotoxins. So thinking about the anatomy of mold, mold is almost like a tree. It's got, you know, a trunk, it's got a root system, and then it has this flowering head, and then it will release spores out of that flowering head. But some molds also release mycotoxins, which are toxic substances, chemical substances, that will fight against any type of threat. And so most of the time, molds will release these mycotoxins if they have the capability of doing it, if they're being threatened in any type of way, um, because you know fungus can't get up and run away from something that's attacking it. It can't bite back or you know fight back. So it has these chemical toxins that it will release. Oftentimes it will release them if you're physically ripping them apart um, or like scrubbing them or trying to clean them yourself. If you find mold in your house, they can release these mycotoxins or if there's another mold species growing towards the mold species that has these mycotoxins. So there's five to seven different types of mold, like I said, that create these mycotoxins. And so we had our home tested and I was just, you know, after chatting with a bunch of different colleagues and professionals in this space, I was like, we got to inspect our house for mold and then found out that you know, found out about the drainage in the house, found out that the vapor barrier wasn't properly sealed. We had an ungodly amount of mold in our crawl space. 
And I also had this gut feeling that it was in our HVAC system. Have no idea why I felt that way, but we ended up having an HVAC servicing company come and check everything out. And lo and behold, the people who installed our HVAC system at this house installed it tilted the wrong way. (laughs) So your HVAC system is supposed to be tilted a certain direction so that the condensation from the coils will drain into um, this piping that kind of shuttles the water out. And so ours was supposed to be tilted forward to the right, and it was literally in the complete opposite direction. It was back into the left. So (laughs) all of the condensation from the HVAC system was draining back into the system. And most HVAC systems have what's called like a damper pad to kind of soften the sound of the system running. And so we had on three sides of the HVAC system about an inch thick of this um, material that was this damper. And so what ended up happening was that this water condensation had you know flown, not flown, but flowed back down into this sound dampener padding in our HVAC system and it molded the entire thing. Well, and so like this guy pulled this stuff out and I was like, oh my God, like not only do we have mold coming from, you know, the bottom of our home and with air stacking effect, you know, it pulls the mold spores up through the rest of the house. Mm-hmm. Um, so not only were we dealing with that, but we also, the lungs of our home that pumps air throughout the entire house was also moldy. Mm-hmm. So when we actually ran tests, um, the people who did our inspection told us that this was like top two worst mold they've ever seen in Colorado, which was somewhat validating. Cause I felt like I was going crazy and I could not figure out what was going on with me. Um, But, you know, to kind of put it into context, anything that is over 100 parts per million, you know, per square foot is considered something that needs to be remediated. And our home was 240,000 parts per million of mold per square foot. So we were just like living in it. And so, yeah, I mean, that was just a crazy journey. And Stu, my husband and I, we've been detoxing very intentionally to get this crap out of our body because it's a living organism um, and you got to get it out because mm-hmm. it'll stay dormant, it'll flare, you know, all sorts of different things. So we've been detoxing for close to a year and a half now going through this complex protocol mm-hmm. of, you know, drainage, detoxification, parasites, gut health, immune health, mold. So yeah, it's been, <laughs> it's been pretty crazy, but yeah. Wow, that is crazy. Yeah. So buying a new home definitely tests for mold when you're doing it. Um, yes. So infrared sauna. Why infrared sauna for detoxification compared to a traditional sauna? And, you know, when I first moved to Denver, I was at Denver Sports Recovery very often and I was going to their infrared sauna using that and now yeah. going to Restore using their infrared sauna. And I've met people at both of those facilities that have, um, you know, told me they're detoxing from mold and it was prescribed to them to use an infrared sauna. So yeah, walk me through why, why infrared sauna to detox compared to a traditional sauna? Yeah. So infrared saunas, and you know this from experience, if anyone listening has been in an infrared sauna, you can feel the difference of a dry sauna versus an infrared sauna, but a dry sauna is largely, we'll start there and then kind of backtrack to infrared. Cause I think it's easier to understand pulling both of these comparisons together, but in a dry sauna, um, essentially you're getting heated from the outside in, right? You're walking into a environment that is very hot. You know, maybe it's a steam sauna or it's just a dry sauna, but it's external heat coming into the body that is causing you to sweat. So in an infrared sauna, essentially what's happening is you're getting infrared red light wavelengths into the body and you're essentially heating the body from the inside out. So infrared saunas will actually change your internal body temperature more than you know a dry sauna or a steam sauna would and so by doing that by heating the body and the cells internally first we're actually detoxing on a deeper level so these infrared wavelengths can help detox your actual cells deeper than a simple dry sauna would and so when it comes to clearing out toxins specifically mycotoxins mold toxins it's really beneficial to get that sweat from the infrared, you know, versus a dry sauna. It's not to say that a dry sauna is not beneficial. You know, if you're sweating, you're sweating, you're potentially Mm -hmm. clearing things, but you're gonna get more bang for your buck per drop of sweat in clearing mycotoxins from an infrared sauna. Um, And there's research on this and there's PubMed studies and NCBI studies that you can look at that will kind of show the benefits of infrared versus dry sauna for clearing toxins and things like that. But um, yeah, the infrared sauna is really kind of unmatched 
And there's specific types of mycotoxins that clear out through the sweat better than other types. So stachyboetrys or any trichothecene family of um, mycotoxins is great to clear through sweat. Same with ochratoxin A, um, which is made by Aspergillus species. So, you know, and chat with your provider, chat with your doctor, your practitioner about this stuff. But I think anyone who's dealing with any type of mold can benefit from infrared sauna and sweating that way. Yeah, I can't agree more. So my routine is typically traditional sauna a few times a week, three, four times a week, and then infrared sauna a couple times a week. And yeah, yeah, the traditional sauna is great to combine with cold exposure. That's why I enjoy doing that. It's obviously going to help reduce inflammation and it's going to increase your serotonin levels and stress resilience. And there's so many benefits of doing that contrast therapy. But then infrared sauna, on the other hand, if you need to detox from something, I mean, that is the go-to protocol is using the infrared sauna. Um, tell me about red light therapy. Do you do red light therapy and if so why yeah so we actually have some red light therapy in our sauna at our house um and you know we've done red light therapy together at restore hyper wellness and you've had the juve panels for a while now so i mean we're both super familiar and love red light therapy but um there's a really great book by ari witten that i think it's literally called red light therapy and it's all about the benefits of photobiomodulation or pbm which is essentially what red light therapy is um, but there's a frequency in this light that really just gives a huge kickstart to the mitochondria in our cells. So it's great for speeding mm -hmm. up the healing process, giving our mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of our cell that creates all of our ATP or our cellular energy. It just gives it a nice boost. Um, so there's a lot of different benefits to red light therapy. But when you're in an infrared sauna, you're still getting some of that, uh, you know, that PBM benefit. But there's also even just like we were saying you know, Restore Hyper Wellness has this too, and Juve lights and all sorts of things where you can actually just do the light itself. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it doesn't have the sauna effect necessarily, but you're still getting that red light photobiomodulation that is going to kind of turn on those cells and give them an extra boost as well. Yeah, yeah. My understanding of the differentiation is, you know, even if the sauna has red light, you have to be fairly close to the red light in order mm -hmm. for your mitochondria to absorb it. So, you know, standing in front of red light panels when you're about six inches away is the go to protocol so that your mitochondria is, is absorbing it. Yeah, it's interesting. There's all of these things at the cellular level where, you know, maybe in the moment you don't feel anything, but it's charging your cells and it's helping with that regenerative process. So, you know, when for I do sure. cold exposure, you know, cryotherapy, like you obviously immediately feel it in the moment and afterwards where some of these other things are at a cellular level and it's just like really good for you because it's going to help energize your cells. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, that's kind of where everything starts, right? Is the mitochondria. And I feel like there's a huge, I don't know if you're seeing this or anybody listening to this podcast is seeing this, but I for sure am seeing it in my field and with my colleagues is this big shift into mitochondrial and cellular health and cellular energy because everything starts there. If we don't have you know, adequate amounts of cellular energy, or we have any type of cellular dysfunction or toxins that are in the cells that are causing dysfunction, we've got to get the mitochondria, you know, back on and plugged in and functioning properly so that we can kick things out on a cellular level. So there's a huge push towards, um, you know, supporting mitochondria and supporting cells like metabolically on a cellular level to boost overall health. And exactly like you said, you know, sometimes you don't notice these things immediately, like, did it work out? And then you feel really good. You know, there's some other things in holistic health and just, you know, having healthy habits where you have these quick responses, but some of the things for mitochondrial health, it's not so quick. Like there's a lot of people that have done the PBM or the red light therapy and they're like, I feel nothing. I just like stood here, but it's time and repetition. It's continuing to go and it's a long game. You know, any of this stuff from a holistic perspective is a long game. If you're addressing the body naturally, you know, it's not a pill. It's not like the magic bullet. It's going to take time and repetition and creating healthy habits, like you were saying before, to really notice a big difference. But the way that I like to think about it for anyone who's creating new habits is the time is going to go on no matter what. You mm -hmm. know, the month is going to pass. The 30 days are going to come and go. And what are you going to do with those 30 days? And then what are you going to do with the 30 days afterward? It's like life's going to keep going. And you could in 30 days feel really freaking great. So why would you not try some of these things and habit stack and create some of these new habits in your life for your health to just see what happens, you know, why not? Yeah. And nine times out of 10, you're going to feel completely different. Yep. Yeah. The hardest part is committing. Um, so I've been lucky enough to experience a lot of your home cooked meals. They taste amazing <laughs> and they're very nourishing. Um, walk me through, you know, kind of your typical diet. Walk me through, you're at the grocery store. What kind of foods are you getting? What are, what are some foods that are nourishing? Yeah, good question. Um, 
I mean, my ethos around food comes from the Nutritional Therapy Association, which is where I got my foundational nutrition education. And the ethos of that is properly prepared, nutrient-dense whole foods. So properly prepared, meaning if it's a grain, nut, seed, legume, that it's soaked, sprouted, fermented. If it's you know, any other type of food that it's prepared in the most nutrient dense, most bioavailable way of consuming that food. Um, so that's kind of like step number one. Um, you know, nutrient dense food obviously is going to come from nutrient dense soils. So understanding your sourcing, where are you getting your food? Is it organic? Is it conventional? What's being sprayed on your food? What kind of soil is your food coming from? Because the health of the soil is fueling the nutrients that are in the food that you're going to be consuming, whether that's an animal or it's a plant. So sourcing is super important for me personally. Mm -hmm. Um, and whole food, real food. So I really focus on trying to eat real food that comes from the earth and comes from the ground and comes from animals and comes from plants and is in its most natural whole form. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that would kind of be the foundational aspects of the way that I eat. And in terms of grocery shopping, um, and you've probably heard this before and people listening probably heard this before too, but this is definitely my ethos of grocery shopping is to shop the perimeter first, everything that is probably going to cause most of your health challenges and inflammation and issues and is processed food is all in the middle aisles. If you think about the way that grocery stores are set up, you've got your, um, you know, your meats and your veggies and your produce and, you know, all of those great more whole foods based things in the perimeter of the grocery store. So Usually the way that I've gotten to this pattern and habit of grocery shopping just over time in eating and consuming foods in this type of way with this, you know, ethos is we just go around the grocery store first and then we bop into the center aisles for, you know, rice and, you know, some high quality potato chips and things like that if we're going to be consuming those types of foods. And so, you know, it's not to say that my diet's necessarily perfectly within those lines all the time. You know, we like to indulge, um, but we also like to make some of our favorite things with higher quality, more nutrient dense products. So for example, and Eric, we do this all the time in our friend group and anytime you guys are over, but if we're making, you know, I don't know, rice krispies, like I'm not going to buy the genetically modified, crappy, probably arsenic filled rice krispies. I'm going to buy like a brown rice, organic Mm -hmm. rice cereal that's been puffed, that's clean, that doesn't have sugar, that's not genetically modified and use that. And I'm going to get high quality marshmallows and grass-fed Kerrygold butter, and that is what we're gonna make our Rice Krispies out of. And it's gonna taste a lot better, it's gonna be way more nutrient dense, it's not gonna have corn syrup and all sorts of other crap in it. So, you know, I would say that's kind of like another tenant of the way that I like to go about nutrition is like, I'm not trying to restrict myself or not enjoy things in life, but I want them to be higher quality so that I'm not, you know, contributing to my toxic burden. And all the other crap that's in the environment from, you know, GMOs to pesticides to herbicides to all those things that we test our clients for that so many of us are filled with that contribute to our overall health issues. Mm -hmm. So, you know, trying to find a balance with all that. And it's not perfect. You know, we all live in the modern world. There's plenty of things that we (laughs) that I eat that everybody eats that's not perfect. You know, I think in an ideal world. If, you know, we had some land and could raise our own animals and raise all of our own veggies and fruits and have trees and all those things, you know, like that'd be incredible. But Mm -hmm. I also love living in Denver, being close to a lot of different things. So it's not practical, but, you know. Agree with you. And, you know, you can subscribe to a CSA. You can have, you know, organic vegetables delivered right to your door. We buy a lot of our meat directly from a farm. So Ballerina Farms is where I've been getting meat from lately in Utah. I know you get, you know, meat from what what do you use? Where where are you getting meat from? Yeah. Currently, we've been going with um, uh, Carter Country Meats. They're out in Wyoming. It's like a generational family owned farm. They've got 40,000 acres. Um, But Ballerina Farms is amazing. And anyone who's listening, check them out on Instagram. It's like the most wholesome Instagram content. Do you follow those guys, Eric? I do. I do. Yeah. It's like the sweetest. They've got like a million kids and like their dairy cow, like right out front. Like it's just the sweetest Mm -hmm. It's the sweetest little Instagram page. But yeah, I can't echo that enough that finding local, you know, either local or regional or national CSAs, family farms that are doing it the right way, regenerative ag, you know, whether it's plants, animals, whatever, just getting high quality food is so important. Yeah. Farmers markets, just dro- buying directly from the source. You know, I, I feel like yep. you know, th- that way it's also in season too, when you're doing it that way. And it's fun to go to these farmers markets and yeah. meet the people that own the farms. So yeah, we've really enjoyed doing that. Um, sure. So 
One of the things I'm looking at getting, and, and you can help me with this, is a glucose monitor. I'm really interested in yeah. like level levels is one of them. Yeah. Um, just to understand, like when I eat something, what is it doing to my blood sugar? Any ones that you'd recommend? And can you speak a little bit to how food affects your blood sugar? Yeah, for sure. Um, levels is great. They're definitely one of the more like prolific and also more expensive options. I've had a few colleagues that really like... Oh, and I'm probably going to say this wrong. It's either NutriSense or NutriScience. I'm forgetting the name of it. But essentially what Eric and I are talking about are continuous glucose monitors or mm -hmm. CGMs. And so this is something Just that you patch. would... Yep. You kind of pop it into your arm and it tracks your glucose continually for an extended period of time. And there's like a little sticker type thing that you put over top of it so you don't accidentally rip it off and pull it out of your arm if you're putting clothes on and off. Mm -hmm. um, and they've started to become more and more popular. I'm a huge fan because blood sugar really is the foundation of so many things. And we talked about digestion, but blood sugar is definitely up there with foundational, very important aspects of overall health, where if we don't have consistent balanced blood sugar levels, we're looking at potentially having dysregulated um, sleep and circadian rhythm and hormones and energy levels and you know mental states. There's so many different things that blood sugar plays into. Um, you know, even going back to my story about that little boy in Bangladesh where like his blood sugar dropped so low that he ended up having a seizure. Like these are very real things that people can experience, um, you know, whether it's too low or it's too high. So, you know, I love the idea of looking at blood sugar and I did this years ago dealing with mold because I was like, what the hell is going on? And I just got a finger prick and checked it, you know, two hours, you know, in a fasted state, two hours after eating in random different times, but I think the CGM option is really great and it's passive and it connects your phone and it's super simple to look at. But in terms of the way that food can impact your blood sugar, you know, one of the most important things that I see that, you know, with our clients is, you know, first and foremost, people just not eating enough. If you're not eating enough and you're, mm -hmm. you know, doing a lot of things throughout the day, your body is going to have to compromise in some sort of way. And so we go through these processes in the body um, that are, you know, somewhat complex, but glycolysis and gluconeogenesis specifically, we largely do in a fasted state where the body will create glucose from protein or, um, you know, through various different processes. And so it's a stressful thing for the body to go, to go through to have to continually pump, you know, our blood sugar levels up by going through this, you know, metabolically intensive process to kind of get blood sugar up into a homeostatic balance. And so if we're eating consistently enough, if we're getting enough fats, and proteins and carbs in good ratio, we should have balanced blood sugar. And so, you know, one kind of image, I guess, that I want to give people while we're talking about this is you can think of blood sugar almost as like a, a graph, you know, an XY graph over an extended period of time. An ideal blood sugar would be, you know, something that's just even keel and consistent throughout the day. But what a lot of people end up getting themselves on is this, you know, what I call a blood sugar roller coaster, where throughout the day, you know, they wake up in a fasted state. Um, you know, maybe their fasted blood sugar is good. Maybe it's high depending upon how their pancreas and blood sugar systems are functioning. Most of the time people will just slam coffee right away, which is a huge drill straight to the adrenal glands, which is going to drive up your cortisol, which is going to drive up your blood sugar. Um, and that's setting us up high. And then oftentimes, you know, an hour or so later, we're hungry. We eat something, you know, after blood sugars dropped. And so we kind of start getting on this hitch of like high, low blood sugar throughout the day. Um, and so one of the most important things I can recommend for people in terms of balancing blood sugar is eating something that is protein rich in the morning. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are not hungry first thing in the morning, and this is a huge sign of liver dysfunction. Sometimes that can be related to blood sugar regulation because glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, you know, the liver is heavily involved in that when we're in fasted states. And when we're waking up in the morning, we are in that fasted state because we've been fasted all night. So supporting blood sugar first thing in the morning by getting enough protein and fat and balancing those levels right off the bat is super important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if we're not hungry in the morning, this can be a sign of, again, I mentioned toxins, but it can also be blood sugar dysregulation because the liver is just too stressed out and it just can't keep up with, you know, this kind of roller coaster that we're on. So, you know, protein, fats are going to be really important for balancing blood sugar because they're going to keep us in that even keel level. Obviously, anything that's super sugary or super carb heavy is going to drive blood sugar up mm -hmm. for most people. Um, a good rule of thumb that I have is consuming complex carbohydrates, so things like sweet potatoes or, you know, starchy carbohydrates that are, you know, vegetable based that kind of have some of those fibers in it that's going to slow down the absorption of the glucose that's in that carbohydrate. 
Mm-hmm. Um, another easy trick is to just make sure you're eating protein and carbs or protein and fats with your carbohydrates. So mm-hmm. I love rice. We eat a lot of white rice. It's easy to digest. It doesn't have the hole on it. It's not going to irritate and inflame the gut. But we always put grass-fed butter in our rice. We're usually eating it with a meal along with some sort of animal protein, some veggies. And, you know, by kind of combining more simple carbohydrates with fats and proteins, again, you're going to slow down the absorption Mm -hmm. of that carbohydrate. And you can kind of avoid that huge spike in blood sugar. So Mm -hmm. I'm super curious to see what you think about the CGM and just what it looks like throughout your day, because training can drive blood sugar up as well. Um, Again, anytime you go into that fasted state, the body's going to you know, overcompromise and sometimes that blood sugar can spike. So I know there's a lot of athletes that see that after using levels or any other CGM and they're like, whoa, like I had no idea my mm-hmm. body was doing this. And, um, you know, I don't think there's like good, bad, wrong, right when it comes to balancing blood sugar, but I think it's important to understand your body's own patterns, what's going to mm-hmm. make you feel the best, what's going to give you more balanced blood sugar and see what that looks like. I've been super interested in buying one of these CGMs, but just haven't gotten around to it. Um, we have a lot of pregnant clients that use this as well because a lot of nausea and, you know, unsavory symptoms or side effects, I guess we'll say of pregnancy can come from low blood sugar, especially in that first trimester. So Mm -hmm. we do have a lot of clients that really love the CGM and tracking blood sugar while pregnant just to keep them feeling good, which is pretty Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, Sam Dancer, CrossFit Games athlete, turned me on to it. And, you know, he was saying that as long as if he had 20 to 30 grams of protein each time he was having carbs, there were no spikes in in blood sugar. And I mean, he's someone who's consuming 500 to 600 grams of carbs a day. You know, he's training three, four hours a day. But yeah, as long as he was having that 20 to 30 grams of protein along with his carbohydrates, um, he would not have spikes in blood sugar. So I thought that was fascinating that, you know, you know, something simple like that. But you just you need you need some kind of monitor to understand what's happening and then you can you know tweak it for sure and it's so bio individual too you know like with sam i would say general population yeah you know getting fats and proteins with carbs should balance those things out but you know some people might need more carbs or more fats to balance that out so it just you know i think that's the fun thing with the cgm is you get to figure out your own bio individual needs with your blood sugar which is awesome mm-hmm. where can people find you they're interested in learning more about gut health, resetting their resetting their gut. Where where can people contact you, and where can people uh, buy your services? Yes, so I'm on Instagram at what Kate eight. It's C A I T, not K A T E. A lot of people search that. Um, so what Kate eight, and my website is katecroll.com. So C A I T C R O W E L L dot com. Um, I also have a small team. That's something that I didn't really share. Is I now have a small company. Um, We should be hiring some more nutritionists by the end of this year, early next year, because our wait list is just blowing up. But right now it's me, another nutritional therapy practitioner and functional nutritionist named Lexi. And then we have an operations manager and admin, Kelsey. And so it's a little powerhouse trio of the three of us. Um, I take on a few one-on-one clients. Lexi takes on the bulk of our clients and we just you know, kind of trug through all of this stuff. And we've got some online programs coming out to kind of meet the demand of the amount of clients that we have and just offer different services at different price points. So yeah, lots of, lots of fun things to look forward to. Um, in terms of the company Instagram page though, it's just at Kroll and Co. So C-R-O-W-E-L-L and Co. C-O on Instagram. That's where we share a lot of our um, you know, blog posts, podcast episodes, just some like nerdy information, some funny quotes and just like no BS types of stuff that we just kind of throw some flair into. So kind of got my personal page, the company website, company Instagram, and then we've got all these awesome programs and a few other people on the team. So we've got some fun stuff going on. Kate has amazing content. Give her a follow and thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with the world. I can't wait to see you tonight and have some nourishing food and uh, hopefully hit some home runs playing wiffle ball. Yeah, <laughs> let's go. I'm excited. <laughs> It'll be a good time. Thanks t- for having me. I'll see you tonight. Thanks for coming on. Yep, thank you. Nine Elements listeners can receive 20% off your first restore service using the code ELEMENTS20 when making your first appointment. That code again is ELEMENTS20 to save 20% when booking your first service at Restore.